Holy, holy, holy. We've sung holy is the Father, holy is the Son, and holy is the Spirit. The theme of our faculty lecture series this year is Trinitarianism. And on uh, Tuesday, we were uh, treated to a, a blessing and delight to uh, go a mile deep and an inch wide into Genesis chapter 1 to uh, discover that uh, while not all of the details of Trinitarianism were contained in Genesis 1, the uh, first seed planted is found in the very beginning of Scripture. And based on the progress of Revelation, all the way through the book of Revelation, and all that God has uh, revealed that sacred Scripture uh, would know that uh, the doctrine of the Trinity is absolutely foundational and fundamental to Christianity, and any deviation from it rightfully would be called false doctrine and heresy. So in this second of five lectures, our beloved Dr. Barrick is coming, and his assigned topic is Trinitarianism and the inspiration of the Word of God. So let's welcome him. As we begin this morning, is it not wonderful that uh, we serve a living God and we have a living word? And it remains living and abides even when some murder it, uh, as some do in murdering the story of the Tower of Babel by a professor sitting on the front row. I could say something about Hebrew being a living language in spite of the depredations of some, too. <laughs> you know, as I come this morning, uh, I am an enthusiast of the theologian William G.T. Shedd. I love reading his dogmatic theology, and I delight in his citations of obscure sermons that we hardly have any record of that remain. And I want to begin with one that he obtained from an otherwise unidentified Dr. South regarding the Trinity. As he that denies this fundamental article of the Christian religion may lose his soul, so he that much strives to understand it may lose his wits. So with such a witticism ensconced firmly in our minds this morning, let's dare to pursue the topic no matter what the risks, as we look at the Trinity. With Shedd's prompting, we can lay out two basic principles of Trinitarianism. I believe you have them there in your handout. First, the great mystery of the Trinity is that the one essence is simultaneously three persons, and the three persons are one essence. That's beyond our comprehension. There's no analogy that can be given to account for it, and the second point is we believe that God is not a unit, but a unity. That these three are a unit, a unified whole. Thus, we briefly define that Holy Trinity. In our Christian theology and doctrine, we identify the three persons as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It matters how we identify them because throughout history and even today in the Islamic world, many have a misunderstanding of the Trinity. Uh, in Islam, they think we believe that the Trinity is the Father, Son, and Mary. Uh, and I didn't understand that very much until I visited Croatia and went into a castle that had some uh, Islamic influence in it, and there was a painting on the wall that depicted three persons. And it was the Father, the Son, and Mary. And I thought, well, no wonder Muslims think that, because when they sacked the castles of Spain and elsewhere in Europe, those are the type of paintings they saw. And they assumed then that that's what we believe, but we do not. Does this doctrine matter of the Trinity? Can we afford as the church to neglect it or to alter it? I think the answer is no. Millard Erickson in his theology warns us that the position we take on the Trinity will have profound bearing on our Christology. He's not the first to notice that. That was noted by Augustine many centuries prior 
when he had written an essay on the Trinity and he suggested a remedial program for those who struggle with the doctrine of the Incarnation. He suggested that they will gain understanding of the mystery of the Trinity by purging their minds, abstaining from sin, doing good works, and engaging in passionate prayer. And that was in his letter De Trinitate, the about or concerning the Trinity. It has always been a challenge for us to consider this topic and to try to wrap our minds around it, our finite mi minds around something that is so huge. Throughout the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, the writers make a clear distinction between the persons of the Godhead, so much so that in my own thinking, I believe that one of the first principles of hermeneutics or interpretation ought to be that we need to distinguish the persons of the Godhead as we read. When we're reading and we're reading about God, which person are we talking about? John Walvoord, many years ago in his book on Jesus Christ, wrote six principles, six guidelines for identifying when the New Testament is speaking about the deity of Christ, when it is speaking about the humanity of Christ, and when it is speaking about the whole person of Christ. And we need to be that distinct and careful in how we read the scriptures when we're reading about what and who God does. And part of that comes out of the possibility that we tend to confuse everything to begin with. How often have you prayed or have I prayed or have others prayed? We begin by saying, Our Father, as we come to you this morning, and then we finish by saying, Thank you for dying for me on the cross. We didn't switch to a different person. We're still praying to God the Father, but somewhere in there our minds switch to God the Son. And the confusion of unbelievers is they hear us thank God for his, him, the Father, dying on the cross. And so we tend to confuse these things, and as we read scriptures, we also have the same confusion, and we need to distinguish the persons very clearly. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinctly separate persons with their individual operations. And the scripture writers tend to also describe all the divine attributes, attributes to those same persons. I would say that the unprejudiced mind cannot doubt the existence of a plurality of persons in the Godhead without impugning the clarity, the inerrancy, and the inspiration of Scripture. If Scripture means anything, if the words mean anything, then there is a plurality of persons even in the Old Testament. Uh, for us to say that the Trinity is not in the Old Testament we would be equally accurate if we said the Trinity is not in the New Testament because the word Trinity is not found. And because 1 John 5, 7 doesn't belong in the New Testament because it uh, is tested, attested to by only five very spurious manuscripts which seem to magically appear after Erasmus produced the New Testament and people complained that the Vulgate's version in 1 John 5, 7 did not find a counterpart in his Greek New Testament. And he said, well, you provide me with a manuscript which includes 1 John 5, 7 in the Greek, and I'll include it in my next edition. And five manuscripts showed up. Interestingly, uh, as far as we know, including some of the writing and the uh, handwriting and everything else done with these and some of the marginal notes, they seem to have all been created after Erasmus did his first publication. So someone back-translated the Latin Vulgate into the Greek to produce these spurious manuscripts. So in reality, there is no direct statement regarding Trinity as Trinity with the word Trinity or saying there are three in one or one made up of three persons anywhere in Scripture, whether old or new. But in both old and new, we have a total of three distinct personages mentioned and it so happens that the New Testament more clearly puts three together in texts like in Matthew 28, which make it easier for us to understand the Trinity in the New Testament than the Old, but it only means we have to work a little harder in the Old to find exactly the same teaching. There are many theologians who express skepticism about the existence of a Trinity in the, uh, in the Scriptures prior to the epistles 
and uh, they question even the Gospels. Uh, RWF Moberly questions both the Old Testament and Gospels as a foundation for our understanding of the Trinity. But the Scripture alone reveals the Trinity. You will not find it in natural revelation. It's only in written revelation. We're dependent upon it. Lewis Berry Chafer observed, uh, no argument has been advanced against the Trinitarian conception other than that it does not conform to the limitations of the mind of man. That's the greatest objection to the Trinity, is we can't get our minds around it. Let's define our terms lest we go astray. First of all, person. That's a term that we used to apply to the individual members of the Godhead. But that personhood does not consist of completely distinct beings like Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Daniel. Negatively, a person does not consist solely of individual interests, activities, or manifestations cohering in one person, namely God. That's uh, getting into modalism. The writers of Scripture attribute the characteristics of personality or personhood to each divine person separately and individually. We see Jesus as the Son of God grieved. We see the Father grieved. We see the Holy Spirit grieved. The Holy Spirit speaks. The Son speaks. The Father speaks. They communicate. We find out they all three have emotions, intellect, and will. And then turn with me to the New Testament for a minute, if you would, to chapter 17, the high priestly prayer of Christ, and take a look at what Jesus says in verse 5 of John 17. Now, Father, notice, he's addressing the Father. He is the Son. Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. In other words, they both existed before creation, independent of creation. And then look down at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Do we need any more evidence than that, that there are at least two specific persons of the Godhead? And in the same discourse, in the Upper Room Discourse, we find Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit being sent to be the replacement comforter for himself. To deny the Trinity is to impugn the integrity of Jesus Christ himself. To deny the Trinity, to question the existence of the Trinity, is to call him disillusioned, a liar, or deceived. As Chafer points out, the denial of the existence of the Trinity dishonors Christ. It dishonors the Holy Spirit. It dishonors the Scriptures themselves. So a rejection of the Trinity must of necessity involve, then, perhaps even the denial of Christ's deity. And that's why we have many uh, saying that we need to rightly understand the Trinity if we're going to rightly understand our Christology our doctrine of Christ. Richard Watson declared that the importance of the doctrine of the Holy Trinity may be finally argued from the manner in which the de denial of it would affect the credit of the Holy Scriptures themselves, for if this doctrine be not contained in them, their tendency to mislead is obvious. Now, as we come to this topic, my topic is the inspira inspiration and the Trinity. And as we talk about that, there's two different ways I could go, and I've tried to go both ways without becoming double-minded or divided, and uh, to try to remain whole and with one direction. But uh, when we talk about inspiration and the Trinity, we're, we can talk about the production of Scripture by the three persons, and we can talk about how the Scriptures themselves speak of the three persons. So let's begin with the production of the Scriptures. The key biblical text, obviously, for inspiration is found in the New Testament, not the Old. 2 Timothy 3.16, but it speaks of the Old Testament because it says all Scripture, pasa grafe, all Scripture is inspired by God. That phrase, inspired by God, is one Greek word, theopneustos. And as we look at that, it means God breathed. And it goes on with a second adjective, and profitable. Let's stop there. We need go no further. 
when we look at that, we see that this, this adjective modifies the word Scripture the same as profitable does. It's not talking about the writers of Scripture. It's not the writers of Scripture that God breathed. It's not the writers of Scripture which are profitable. The quality of inspiration resides in the Scriptures and the Scripture alone. Biblically, the only biblical language that we can use is to talk about inspired Scripture, not inspired writers. Those writers were superintended and led and moved, moved along by the Holy Spirit and aided in their writing and record of what God wanted them to write, but they were not God-breathed. And they had words that were not included in that. that uh, they, there's letters that they wrote that are not included in Scripture. There's conversations they had where their words were not God-breathed either. So we do not attribute inspiration to the writers. We attribute inspiration to the Scriptures and the Scriptures alone. And the fact that God breathed also alludes to the fact that the origin and contents of Scripture are due to the divine breath, the Holy Spirit himself. So that gives us our first person involved in inspiration, the Holy Spirit. He's the third person of the Godhead. He guided, he directed, and he superintended the human authors of Scripture. Second Samuel 23, 2, going now to the Old Testament. The Spirit of Yahweh spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. Those are the words of David. We have the same in Nehemiah 9, 30. However, you bore with them for many years and monished them by your spirit through your prophets. Jeremiah 34, 12, then the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah from Yahweh, saying, and Ezekiel 11, 5, the spirit of Yahweh fell upon me, and he said to me, say, thus says Yahweh. Zechariah 7, 12, they made their hearts like flint, so that they could not hear the law and the words which Yahweh of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. The, the Old Testament's very clear. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, was directly involved in the process of inspiration, in the production of God-breathed Scripture. He is involved. He takes the key, the lead, lead role, so to speak, in that process. He initiates and he superintends the writing of divine revelation. He is the author of Scripture, more so than the men that are used. R.C. Sproul says, The Spirit is not divorced from the Word in such a way as to reduce revelation to an exercise in subjectivism. The Spirit works with the Word, cum verbo, and through the Word, per verbum, not without or apart from the Word, sine verbo. He is absolutely essential in the process of inspiration of Scripture, and this is attested to by the Old Testament, not just the New. This is a doctrine that is known in both Testaments. The New Testament is not giving us new revelation when it talks about the Spirit moving the holy men of old as they spoke and wrote. This is directly from the, old, the pages of the Old Testament. But then the second person of the Godhead becomes also involved. And to this, we need to take a careful look at what are sometimes called the Christophanies of the Old Testament, the appearances of Christ. But that is an uh, anachronistic title because he was not Christ, he was not Messiah until his incarnation. So there is no pre-incarnate view of Messiah in the Old Testament. The person who appears there is the Son of God. Therefore, we should use the Greek word huios and look at it as a huiophany, not just a theophany. A theophany is an appearance of God, but you can't distinguish which person of the Godhead. But these are huiophanies, and I'll explain that as we go along. They're appearance of the second person of the Godhead, and these fulfilled a vital role in the production of Scripture. The Old Testament writer spoke often of the appearance of God in some manifestation to his people for the purpose of delivering them 
for the purpose of leading them or communicating with them, and most often it has to do with communication. One of the primary examples of this phenomenon is in the giving of the law on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19, where we have a theophany that, as we're going to discover, is a weophany. Remember, the same God who appeared on Mount Sinai was begged and beseeched by Moses to show himself to Moses on the mountain. And God placed him in a cleft in the rock and his hand over him and passed by him so that he might see the residue of his, of his glory. Whom did Moses see? Did he see the Father, the Son, or the Spirit? We'll answer that question in a little bit. Other instances of divine manifestation arise with the ministry of what is known as the angel of Yahweh, or the angel of the Lord. And in that, we would be better off to switch the word angel out and use the term messenger, because that's what it really means. An angel is a messenger. The Hebrew word malak is messenger. When we talk about angel, we're already predisposing ourselves to imagining an individual angel, an angelic being, rather than understanding this as a divine being. So use the term messenger instead. Genesis 16, 7 through 13, we have an appearance of God to Hagar, the handmaiden of Sarah, after Sarah has cast her out. And notice it is the narrator, it is Moses himself superintended by the Holy Spirit in the accuracy and integrity of his writing the account, he is the one who says, then she called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her. She didn't say that. Moses did. The writer did. Under the superintending work of the Holy Spirit himself, he said that the messenger of Yahweh who appeared to Hagar was Yahweh. Later, at the burning bush at Mount Horeb, Moses sees a vision of God. He has the burning bush experience, and he records this, again under the superintending with the Holy Spirit, that God called to him from the midst of the bush in Exodus 3.2. God called to him from the midst of the bush. In Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 23, we have another divine manifestation appearing to Gideon. And the writer of the book of Judges, superintended by the Holy Spirit, not Gideon. This is not, you know, some like to say, well, you know, the person who was experiencing this, the angel was so marvelous and so glorious that, that you know, it, it, he came across as being God, that the individual who had the experience being a human being, being a fallen being like you and like I am, he just thought, wow, I've never seen anything like this. This must be God, erroneously attributing to the angel the characteristic of deity. Even Gene Merrill argues that way, which surprised me in his theology, Everlasting Dominion. But how can that be? If you believe in the inspiration of Scripture, it's the writer of Scripture in looking at Judges 6, 11 through 23 and recording what was being done, it's the writer, not Gideon, who said, quote in verse 14 of chapter 6, Yahweh looked at him and said... There's no doubt about it. The person who is there in the presence of Gideon is Yahweh himself. That cannot be denied. Such theophanies seem to possess one significant feature. All of them reveal, at least in some partial manner, something about God himself or his will to the recipient. The definition of a Christophany, which James Borland give, gives in his excellent book entitled, uh, I thought I had it down here somewhere. I do. There we go. Christ in the Old Testament. In his excellent book on Christ in the Old Testament, he talks about a definition for a Christophany, which I'm telling you ought to be a weophany instead, and I would prefer that. It's more accurate. It's not anachronistic. Uh, he says, it runs, as it runs as follows, those unsought, in intermittent, and temporary, visible and audible manifestations of God the Son 
in human form by which God communicated something to certain conscious human beings on earth prior to the birth of Jesus Christ. Notice the elements of this. These occur with conscious human beings. It's not in dreams. It's not in visions. They are conscious. There is a reality to it. There's an interaction. Like in Genesis chapter 18 when the three men appeared to Abraham at his tent door. And as time goes by we realize that two of these may be angels but one of them he refers to as Yahweh. He addresses as Yahweh. And the record in the text written by Moses says it is Yahweh speaking to him. That is a weophany. It's the appearance of the sun. So as we're looking at that, let's go back again then to the term messenger. Understand that messenger is one who's subordinate. It's like the title for son. The title son is one who is in submission to one who has the title of father. So when we talk about the sonship of God, the sonship of the second person, we're talking about his submission to the first person in his fatherhood for the purpose of the program of redemption. And it was determined in the council of the Godhead prior to the foundations of the earth in eternity past. In fact, as one writer says here, uh, in fact, shed, it is a Trinitarian or filial subordination that is subordination in respect to order and relationship. As a relation, sonship is subordinate to fatherhood. But note this is not an eternal subordination. That's a heresy to have eternal subordinationism and to make inequality in the Godhead. Look at John chapter 12 for a minute. Let's look at what Jesus says about his relationship as son to the father. John chapter 12, verse 49. John chapter 12, verse 49. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the father himself who sent me. Sound familiar? The messenger of Yahweh in the Old Testament. The, the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. Who is submitted to whom? The Son is submitted to the Father. Is that the way it was in eternity past from the very beginning with, where there is no beginning? Was there always this subordination, this submission? this order of uh, commanding to the one who is son? Or is that something that was adopted later? I author to you from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, that sonship is temporary, and sonship was initiated at Psalm 2-7, at a time in eternity past, prior to the foundation of the earth. John 14, 10, Jesus said, Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? In other words, don't you believe that we are one? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. And then in chapter 17, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Notice it's your word, the Father's word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. And they received them and truly understand, understood that I come, came forth from you and they believed that you sent me. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Now we have all three persons of the Godhead, right? Because Jesus says very clearly that the word he brought even in the Old Testament as the messenger of Yahweh was the word of the Father. All three persons the Godhead are involved in the production of Scripture. It originates with God the Father. The spokesperson is God the Son who appears as the messenger of Yahweh to give the message to his chosen people and to the prophets and others. And the Holy Spirit superintends the writing and record of those words. So it is God the Father sending the Son to speak to man, and as man then records it, the Holy Spirit then aids and superintends 
in the writing and the inscripturation of the divine word. When we consider this matter of the interrelationship between the Father and Son, we also need to observe a degree of theological caution. Bruce Ware asked that we beware. Did you catch that, Dr. Murphy? <laughs> of reducing the imminent or essential trinity to the economic or functional trinity. The former must always be, uh, must always be understood as logically, temporally, and theologically prior to the latter. Gentlemen, remember, Jesus talked about the relationship he had to God the Father before the foundation of the world. The distinction of the persons of the Godhead, the interaction of the persons of the Godhead, existed before there was a creation. It was even before the creation, before the foundation of the world, that the first person of the Godhead appointed the second person of the Godhead, and in mutual agreement, the second person of the Godhead being fully co-equal to the first person, accepted that task which would require that he submit to the authority of the first person and be sent by him to do the work that he would be appointed to. And that was all decided before the foundation of the world, which proves that open theism is uh, inaccurate in thinking like John Sanders does in The God Who Risked, that when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, that it caught God by surprise, and so God had to move to plan B. God never had a plan B. It's always been plan A. His plan A was what he decided even before he created the earth, even before he created man on it. He had already decided that the second person of the Godhead would be the Redeemer, and he would be sent to die for the sins of the world before there even was a world. Check the Scriptures. That is the scriptural indication. Anything other than that is a violation of Scripture and an impugning not only of the integrity of Scripture, but the integrity of the authors of Scripture. It impugns the integrity and the authority and the accuracy of the Holy Spirit who superintended and guided the writers in recording those words. It impugns the authority and integrity of the Son of God, who was the one who verbalized, who spoke those words to those men. And it impugns the authority of God the Father, who is the one who sent the Son with that message. You see, this is the seriousness of not holding to the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture is that the non-inspiration or non-inerrancy of Scripture is really impugning the character of God in all three persons. It is one of the highest forms of blasphemy that we can commit in not listening to Scripture. Let's get to the question I mentioned earlier about how we know that it's the Son. It's a theophany in the Old Testament. John chapter 1 verse 18. John the Apostle, again, I'm going to say this, we need to repeat it to ourselves every time we read Scripture. Who is writing? Who is speaking? We know that the writers record the words and conversations of people who spoke lies, who spoke error, we know that they recorded accounts of people who misunderstood and misinterpreted the appearances that they saw around them, the events and their environment. So we need to ask the question, is this some individual's uh, impression of an event by which he says this, or is this the writer himself under the direct superintendence of the Holy Spirit? that is making the comment. John 1.18, it's John, the writer, the narrator of the gospel, who is the one who is talking. And he says, under the superintending work of the Holy Spirit, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Moses did not see God the Father on Mount Sinai. He saw God the Son. Gideon did not see God the Father. He saw God the Son. Hagar did not see God the Father. She saw God the Son. 
Every appearance of God in the Old Testament has been an appearance of the Son of God, not of the first person of the Godhead. That word explained is literally the word we get exegete from or exegesis. Literally, the Son of God exegetes the Father to mankind. Jeffrey Niehau stresses the fact that God is not silent when he appears in these theophanies. As another scholar, Millar Burroughs, words it, God appears in order to speak. And that divine spokesman is the Son of God himself. It's no wonder that John opens the epistle by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was what? The Word was God. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's his eternal title. His Son, being Son, is not eternal. Being Word is eternal. He is the Word. Yes, the God who speaks in the second person of Godhead, the pre-incarnate Messiah, is the same who spoke the world into existence in Genesis chapter 1. And we find that in John chapter 1 and in Colossians chapter 1. Thus the revelator in both testaments is the same person the Godhead, the second person, the Son. Now, let's talk about what the Scriptures say about the inspiration in the New Testament use of the Old Testament regarding the plurality of divine persons in the Old Testament itself. Mark 12, 35 to 37, Jesus is the one speaking. Please keep that in mind. He's the one who quotes from Psalm 110, verse 1. He's the one who says that Christ is the son of David and that he is the Lord about whom the psalmist writes. Luke chapter 4, which Dr. Murphy mentioned on Tuesday, Jesus is reading Isaiah 61, and he says, when he finishes reading, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's what Jesus said, not what Dr. Murphy said, not what Dr. Barrick said, it's what Jesus said. Whose word do you trust more? Now, I hope that you trust Jesus' word about the word more than you trust Dr. Murphy's word about the Tower of Babel, right? <laughs> John chapter 12, verses 36 to 41. Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. And look again, it's Jesus. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah. Now it's the writer speaking, John again, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe. And he goes on to say, that these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Who's the him that John is talking about? Jesus Christ himself. And the Holy Spirit is the one who superintended him writing that and making that identification. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 8 and 9 uh, cites Psalm 45 verses 6 and 8, your throne, O God. And the writer, under the superintending work of the Holy Spirit, says, but of the Son, S-O-N, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Hebrews 5, 5, and 6 cites both Psalms 2, 7 and 110, verse 4. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become, notice the initiation, to become a high priest. He was not always a priest. Jesus' priesthood is not eternal. It's temporal. It had a beginning. He was appointed to it. And the writer of Hebrews says, He who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you, just as he says also in another passage, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In other words, both offices were not taken by the son. They were given to the son. They were appointed to him. And they each had a starting point. If the New Testament writers are skewing the words of the Old Testament to make them mean something they ought not to mean, then we ought not trust their words. If the New Testament is indeed God-breathed Scripture, then that inspiration guarantees their accuracy, their integrity, their inerrancy. If there is no plurality of persons in the Godhead, then the New Testament writers have misinterpreted the Old Testament and have deceived its readers. 
But God cannot lie, and he is the ultimate author of all of Scripture, as we've seen. Both, all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are authors of Scripture. He, they are trustworthy, so the word is trustworthy. Their word is trust, trustworthy. They are without error, so their word must be without error. Now, I have other notes that I'm not going to cover here. I could go into the grammar of inspiration. Uh, Dr. Murphy talked about the plural Elohim, and he gave you a very adequate, accurate, and full, in-depth description of being very cautious and wary of trying to argue for the Trinity on the basis of the plural form of Elohim. And he suggested to you, quite rightly, that instead the Trinity is better seen in the plural pronouns uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, chapter 3, verse 22, and chapter 11, verse 7. Those are not plurals of majesty. They are literal plurals. And they occur outside. We see them in Isaiah 6, 8, where uh, the Yahweh, who is uplifted in the temple in all his glory, says, Whom shall we send? It's the same we. And by the way, as when we're talking about grammar, the hymn we sang, Holy, 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 that's not a proof of the Trinity. If that's a proof of the Trinity, then what do you do with I will overturn, 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 or earth, earth, earth? Are we going to say there's three earths? Are we going to say there's three destructions of uh, Israel? Uh, th that triplet is for the purpose of uh, showing a supremacy. It's showing uh, something that is emphatic. It's a superlative. It's saying, in essence, most holy, supremely holy. It's no indication of the persons the Godhead. And as we look at that, we have to be aware of that and not read into it what is not there. And uh, we must re also remember that it's not only in the Old Testament that you have these divine first person plurals utilized, because it's used in John chapter 14, verse 23 where Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. There's the divine plural in the mouth of Jesus Christ. And he's speaking of himself and the Father specifically, and by context in the upper room discourse, he's including the Holy Spirit. They are the we. And in case you have heard that we, as a pronoun, could be majestic or royal in the Old Testament, read Juon and Morok, I think Dr. Murphy may have mentioned this to you, where they say there is no such thing as a royal we with pronouns in Hebrew. Let's look at some specific texts real quickly as in our closing time with regard to what the Old Testament has to say about the Trinity. We saw the Trinity is, is involved in its inspiration. Now let's look what inspired scripture has to say about the Trinity in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 63 verses 7 through 10 is one of my favorite passages of all of them in the Old Testament where it becomes so very clear we're talking about three persons and only three persons. We have three individuals, we have three titles, and they're clearly distinguished by the operations they perform. Verse 7, I shall make mention of the loving kindnesses of Yahweh the praises of Yahweh, according to all that Yahweh has granted us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has granted them according to his compassion and according to the abundance of his loving kindness. For he said, surely they are my people, sons who will not deal falsely. So he became their savior in all their affliction. He was afflicted and the messenger of his presence saved them. God ordains and orders and commands the salvation, the deliverance. But as in sending the messenger with the word, he sends the messenger to be the Savior. So the actual Savior is the messenger of his presence, the messenger of Yahweh, the angel of the Lord. In his love and his mercy, he redeemed them. The word ga'al for kinship redemption. And he lifted them and carried them all the days of old, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. We have all three persons here. The Yahweh who sends the messenger 
to be the Savior and Deliverer and the Holy Spirit who is grieved by the rebellion of his people. Three persons. Look in that text and see if you might find a fourth. You will not find a fourth. In fact, nowhere in the Old Testament do you find a fourth or a fifth or a sixth or a seventh. You find three and three alone. Just as clearly as in Matthew chapter 28 within one verse, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here you have the same Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as Yahweh, the messenger of Yahweh, the weophany, the appearance of the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit. They're all three here. Yes, the Trinity is in the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 13 verse 7 becomes even clearer. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. What did Matthew write about that? What did Jesus say in his interpretation of Zechariah chapter 13 was? He said, this is myself, Jesus. And when I died, when, when I die, when I've been crucified, when I'm gone, then my disciples are going to be scattered. And he quotes from Zechariah chapter 13 that they will have stricken the shepherd. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. The one speaking is Yahweh, the Father. And against the man, my associate. About whom is he speaking? This word for associate means a co-equal. A co-equal. This word can be used of Dr. Murphy and myself as being associates. It cannot be used of Dr. Murphy and God being associates or Dr. Barrick and God being associates because we are not equal to God. This can only be used between two persons of the Godhead. The shepherd, Jesus Christ himself, is the associate of Yahweh. The co-equal of Yahweh declares Yahweh of hosts. Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered and I will turn my hand against the little ones. There's no doubt about it. We're talking about co-equality co-deity among more than one person of the Godhead. There are also interrelationships. Shed identifies 12 actions and relations that serve as proof of the existence of three persons in a Trinitarian Godhead. And uh, those 12 are that one divine person loves another or dwells in another or suffers from another or knows another or addresses another or is the way to another, or speaks of another, or glorifies another, or confers with another, or plans with another, or sends another, or rewards another. And you'll notice he gives many references to the Old Testament as well. We'll look in the Old Testament at the passages with one person, the Godhead, acting in regard to another. Numbers 11.25. Then Yahweh came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and he took of the Spirit who was upon him and placed him upon the seventy elders. Nehemiah 9, verses 27 and 20. You are Yahweh God who chose Abraham. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. And we can go over and over and over again about distinguishing between those two, between Yahweh and the spirit. We can go on and on through the books of Isaiah, through Psalms, through Joel and Ezekiel. Look at passages with one person, the Godhead, speaking about another. Yahweh said... My spirit shall not strive with man forever. Genesis 6.30. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, And I have filled him with the spirit of God. Exodus chapter 31 verse 1. Yahweh therefore said to Moses, And I will take of the spirit who is upon you. Numbers 11.16. So Yahweh said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit. Numbers 27.18. Psalm 2.7. I will surely tell of the decrees of Yahweh. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. That's not a human king. You read through the rest of the psalm and you find out that there is no king of Israel who could ever fit the description that is given there of this one who is king who is called son. There is ne never anywhere in scripture, unless it's here in Psalm 2, that a man is blessed by God for fleeing to a king for refuge, a human king. And there is no human king that God has said of him, you kings of all the world, you go and you kiss him in worship. Because God never commanded the worship of any human being. And it's not to a human king that God will allow the ruling of all the nations of the world with a rod of iron breaking them as clay vessels. 
and it was not to a human king that God said, today you are my son. If it is inadequate to look at the context itself in Psalm 2 and to come to that conclusion, what in the world can we do then when we go to a place like Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, where it's very clearly declared that that's talking about Jesus Christ? You see, we run the danger here of saying, oh, well, the New Testament writers didn't understand the Old Testament correctly. They misunderstood. They misapplied. They skewed it. How can that be if they are superintended by the Holy Spirit? If they skewed it, it's the Holy Spirit who skews it. If the Holy Spirit is the one who skewed the text and skewed the meaning, then it was the Son of God who spoke those words, who is also skewing it, and it's the Father who sent the messenger with those words, who is also skewing it himself. And we end up with a very perverted view of the Godhead. And we end up with a very divided view of Scripture. That which is written in the New Testament will believe, but in the Old Testament we won't. And especially we won't believe it if the New Testament says, this is the interpretation of an Old Testament text. We say, no, that can't be. And we claim that the context in the Old Testament overrules the statement or use in the New Testament. And we end up then really with a weird view of inspiration that says that God is allowed to twist the text any way he wants to make it say what he wants and that uh, he doesn't want us to treat it the same way when we speak it. And yet look at the teaching of Jesus and we are to go forth speaking the word as he spoke the word. And we are to go forth in the power of the spirit, the same spirit that gave the word is in us that we are to speak the word. How are we exegeting it? We need to be very careful. And I would say that in most cases, we have misinterpreted the context of the old. Well, there's much, much more, as you can tell from what I've given you there, that I have to cover in the article, and we've come nowhere near covering all of it. Let me draw the conclusions. First of all, the Old Testament identifies a plurality of divine persons associated with Yahweh. One of my favorites is in Genesis 19, 24. When Yahweh in heaven rains down fire and brimstone so that the Yahweh standing on the earth, the same Yahweh that was in Genesis 18, speaking with Abraham, receives that brimstone and fire and destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. Because the Yahweh on the earth rained down fire and brimstone from Yahweh in heaven, it says. There are two Yahwehs there. Use that with your Jehovah's Witnesses that come to your door. All right? Tell them, I've got two Yahwehs here. All right? According to both Old Testament and New Testament, the Holy Spirit superintends the writing of inspired Scripture. And that superintending the writing is also accompanied by the giving by the revelator, the second person, and by the sending of the word originating from the Father above. The messenger of Yahweh is the main revelator of the Old Testament, and as such, he is subordinate to the Father and obeying his commands. And the New Testament writers cite the Old Testament text for the deity of Jesus Christ, proving that he is that messenger and that he is the Son of God. Well, there's so much there. This is an inexhaustible uh, topic. Every one of us could get up here and go on and on but we've got to bring this to a close. Dr. Murphy had the privilege of dealing with one chapter. I had to deal with the other chapters of the Old Testament, and as you saw, to do that, I had to also go to the New Testament. So I hope there's something left for the men who come after me, but I guarantee there's plenty left. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you for everything that you've shown us and given us. We thank you for your word. We praise you for your word. And we ask now that we might be those who are obedient to your word, conveying it accurately, teaching it well, preaching it with authority, and doing that which you ask of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.